Okay, so when, so far a lot of programming you guys have done has been programming not in this course. Even when you were taking SQL last term, that's not programming. That is learning a language that lets you interact with a database. It's not the same thing as programming because there's single statements. Databases, or I should say database servers, do have the ability to be programmed. Um, and they have three pieces that you can program. Um, stored procedures, functions, and uh, triggers. The first part of today's lecture will be about stored procedures and functions. Um, and I'll be talking about, you know, how you do stored procedures in MySQL, what they are, functions, and what's the difference between a function and a stored procedure. All right, so, <clears throat> wall of text. A stored procedure, a stored procedure is a sequence of SQL commands that are stored in the database, so you can invoke it later. Whether you want to invoke it at the command line, invoke it as part of an application, uh, you essentially execute it. Um, they are pre-compiled. That means the database server already knows how to run the queries. It stores the statistics and how to uh, run the query as part of the queries as part of the uh, server procedure. So often it's going to run faster. They act like a script. So you guys have probably learned a little bit of scripting by now, I hope, where, you know, it starts at the top, it ends at the bottom. Um, stored procedures cannot return a value. So when you write functions in Python, your functions usually should return a value, whether it's returning a string, an integer, or through true, false, but it should usually return something. Store procedures do not return a value. It's literally a little program. It runs and ends. Um, it can include many SQL statements, including ins select, insert, update, delete, basically anything that is uh, DML. You can't do DDL with it. You can't use a store procedure to change the structure of a database. Um, it does have input and output parameters. So when I said that it doesn't return a value, it's a bit of a strange way of wording it. Because it you can't you don't have like a return statement at the end that says return this. What you have is input and output parameters. So you feed it variables into it, like values into it, and you can feed it placeholders for what comes back out. Um, did you guys learn about uh, in any of your programming classes about pass by reference? Okay, this is the same idea as a pass by reference. So you got something on the outside that's passed into the function, the store procedure. Store procedure sets some values to it. And when it's done, the values basically are on the outside because it's passing in by reference. Um, it can call functions. So if you have custom functions, you can call them. Uh, they support transactions. So you can actually start and complete a transaction in your stored procedure. They can't be used in a join clause um, because normally uh, you execute it by typing in the call command and not select. Therefore, you can't use a join and a call command. All right, so the syntax looks something like this, and there's actually some examples in the slides. Um, so you create a procedure, so it's create procedure, you give it a name, and then you feed it a bunch of parameters. So this so far it looks kind of like creating a function in your preferred programming language. Um, and then you have a begin, there's the code, and an end. and the begin and end actually contain the hi the programming logic you'll have to ask your classmates about the announcement have a seat there's was an announcement to start a class so you'll have to ask your classmates later but it involved two pieces of bad news and one piece of good news anyways um so the parameter specs are as follows there's the option to make it in out or in out so you can actually have a parameter that comes in with a value and it gets modified as part of the process and it will feed it back out. Um, so in mode allows you to pass value into the store procedure, out mode allows you to pass the value back out of the procedure, um, in out it's bi-directional. So we have two examples here, um, select two tables, one has department, one has employees. Um, let's try to vaguely remember the structure. 
And suppose we want to keep track of the total salaries of the employees working for each department. So the example here, we create a table and essentially it includes the department number and the total salary from the department. Right now the total salary is zero. So essentially we created a placeholder table. All right, so one of the things about working with MySQL, and this is the only database that you have to do this. So you know normally your delimiter for commands in MySQL is a semicolon, right? You know, select star from customers, semicolon. Then you can, theory, you could type in update customers, blah, 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 semicolon, all on one line, it'll execute them one after another. Cool. Well, the problem is, is that you're going to be putting semicolons inside the store procedure. So you have to tell MySQL to ignore the semicolons now. And delimiter slash slash, you're basically telling it, we're going to change the delimiter from semicolon to double slash. So double slash will now terminate the command. And you'll see what this looks like in a moment. All right, so of course the code is like super tiny. That went well. Right, that's a little bit better. So let me zoom out so I can go through the slide. So we're going to define a procedure called update salary. It'll take an input as a department number. The procedure itself is going to be a single SQL command that updates the total salary from the sale. And then it'll end. So this is what it looks like. So you go delimiter slash slash, you create procedure, update salary, and then it has an in parameter. It's called param1. It's an integer. So now we're saying that there's a parameter called param1. It's going to be an integer and it's incoming. Then we do begin. The begin says the code block starts here. And then we have our update department salary, set the total equal to select whatever, right, standard SQL, where the department number is equal to the parameter, semicolon. Because we have to tell it to ignore the semicolon. Then we put in end with another semicolon, and we add in the two slashes to tell it this is the actually end of the command. Then the query complete, it's, it's going to say it's good because it's on the double slash. Right now, double slash is your new end of end of command. So then step three, let me zoom in. We put the delimiter back to a semicolon. So you change the delimiter, create your procedure. This also applies to functions and triggers. So anytime you're programming the database, you have to change the delimiter and then you change it back once you're done. Otherwise, you know, it'll stay like that until you disconnect and reconnect. So then we can call the procedure and you'd literally go call whatever the procedure is called, give it the parameter, and then stuff happens. And it'll just execute the code. Nothing, nothing serious, it just happens. And I don't know why there's a green box there. Um, that's fun. So if we did a select from the department salaries, you'd see that the salaries have updated. Okay. So there's a command called show procedure status. And it'll display the list of stored procedures you've created. The issue with using MySQL at the command line, there's no easy way to see the code of the procedure. MySQL Workbench has tools to extract the code of the procedure. At the command line, it's not so easy. Uh, if you want to drop a procedure, it's drop procedure, whatever it's called, and it just goes away, just like drop table. It's nothing too, too complicated there. Um, so here's some things about MySQL's language. Um, it has a language. It's called runtime. It's just so original. Um, I don't know why they decided to call it runtime, but it's called runtime. So <laughs> inside your store procedures and anything I'm teaching right now, I'll also apply to functions and triggers. So 
That's why we spent so much time on the store procedures at the beginning, because it applies to the other two things, too. You can declare variables. Sounds like a programming language. Yeah, there's flow control statements, including if, then, else, while, and repeat. Yep. It's not case sensitive about that. Uh, SQL keywords are not case sensitive. Yeah, but that's still SQL. Um, MySQL supports cursors, and I'll, there's actually going to be an example of a cursor in a minute. Um, but a cursor is used to iterate through a set of rows. So in other words, you run a query inside the stored procedure, and then you can loop through the records. And there's a link here that shows you guys, you know, if you really want to go read about it. And it's not at the terrible MySQL site. It's at mysqltutorial.org. It's actually a really decent site to teach you how to use this stuff. Like it takes you by the hand. And uh, if I remember, they even have a little spot where you can execute commands to try them. So, you know. Okay. So... Right now, we are going to update department salaries, set the total salary to zero, because the way we wrote the, the procedure originally is we have to run it for every department. And we'd have to know how many departments we have. So suddenly, if we have a new department and the person that's manually doing the calls every night doesn't know about it, one of the departments will not get updated. So it only works as one. So this example, we're going to reset the table to zero. And here's a big fat Big fat uh, declaration. I'm going to zoom in a bit, make it a little easier to read. All right. So this time we're going to set the delimiter to double dollar sign. This is just to show you guys that it really makes no difference what you set the delimiter to. Just make it something that you normally wouldn't use in your code. So whether you use double slash, double dollar sign, uh, you can't use uh, the, the uh, pound symbol because that's actually a comment. Yes. No, no, you type it in, delimiter space, double dollar sign, delimiter space, plus, plus. Actually, plus, plus, probably not a good idea. But, you know, um, you could use uh, double tilde, or you could use, um, you know, double ampersands, whatever you want. You just type it in. No, 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 you don't do it in any settings. You could literally go... Um, Set delimiter, just like that. That's it. Actually, no semicolon. Set delimiter that. And if I do this, and I run it, uh, did it actually run? Yeah, no, that's how you set the delimiter. Or actually, no, do you? Does it need it? Maybe not. Let's try this. Boom. Run. Yeah, it's doing enough. I go select star from customers. Uh, actually, it's not customers. What table am I looking at here? Sample. And I do double dollar sign and I go select star from sample limit one. Actually, I'm not sure how much MySQL Workbench is going to like this, but we're going to try it. Uh, you have a syntax error. Take the whole thing and run it. Because with MySQL Workbench, it forgets the second after you run the command. It's stupid that way. Um, so now if I were to go run it again, it's not going to be happy. So when you're doing your work in MySQL Workbench, you have to include the delimiter right at the top before you run the whole thing through. I was going to bring that up in a bit, but no, no. I was hoping that the latest version of MySQL, I guess I'd installed, they'd fix that issue, but I guess not. So, Okay, so then we're going to create a procedure, update salary. Notice there's no parameters on this one. Begin. Now we're going to declare um, several variables. We're going to declare, declare a variable called done. It's an integer. It's going to default to zero. You declare a current uh, department number to int. Then we're going to declare a dnumcursor, department number cursor, as a cursor for, 
And then you can see select D number from department style. So what this is doing is it's declaring something called a cursor. It's naming it this for this SQL statement. And then this is the other spot where MySQL is extra special. Declare continue handler for not found. Set done equal one. If to get this to actually blow up properly, when it hits the end of records, it's going to issue a record not found command error. So we're putting in a special handler here to tell it, hey, we've reached the end. I got no record not found, so we're going to set the done variable equal to one. That's what that's saying. Every other database I've ever worked with, we can just basically use the equivalent of a for each or a while, you know, while cursor fetch next, whatever. No, not in this. You, it, this one can't handle, MySQL cannot handle, gracefully handle a failed fetch. It's, it is what it is. So then we have an open, open the cursor. So what that's doing is it's issuing the select statement at that point. So it's actually running your cursor. So it's a bit like if you were in Python where you did, okay, doll, uh, sorry, I was about to do this in PHP. But anyways, SQL is equal, quote mark, select denum from department style, close quote, no semicolon because it's Python. And then you'd execute, and I don't know what it is to execute against the database, but you execute, execute the SQL command. That's what this is doing. So you open the cursor. Then we start a repeat. Repeat is the same thing as a while. You could use a while also. Um, it just repeats got an, as an interesting syntax, uh, which is why some people like it for this. So repeat, and at the bottom you'll see until done, because you know if done is set to zero, that means it's false. So until done is basically not equal to zero. So it's going to repeat until done, and then end repeat. And what's happening in the middle is we're going to fetch denum cursor into current denum. So what's happening is because we're pulling back a single column in our SQL statement, every time we fetch, we're going to fetch the cursor into the variable we defined. We're going to update the department salary, set total salary equal to blah, 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 just like before, where the denum is equal to the current denum. I could see definitely better ways to write this, but you know it is what it is. We end the repeat. We close the cursor. We hit the end of the code with our double dollar signs. Congratulations, the store procedure is done. I mean, this is a, something you guys could probably just type in from using the example. Um, you know, because everything's there. So when we call the procedure, if we just select start from department style, and then we do call update salary, you'll notice there's no parameters. It'll do the exact same work it did before. But now if we add a new department, life is good. Um, now we can create a procedure to give the raise to all employees. And this one's roughly the same setup as before. We declare done the employee ID and the salary. We declare our cursor. But you'll notice this time that we're selecting two columns instead of just one. And then here's our wonderful continue handler because MySQL is too stupid to understand how to do a while true. We open the cursor we're going to repeat so we're going to fetch the first row of the curse of the query into e id and sal so you'll notice that e id matches the id here salary matches this so you can actually fetch into multiple variables at once you just come and delimit them and the number of columns coming back from here must match here otherwise you'll probably get errors uh, and then we're going to update the employee. We're going to set the salary equal to the salary plus, you know, whatever amount, because we're adding an amount at the top as the parameter. Where the employee ID is this. Um, so we could probably, you know, make the salary be one point. You could make the salary point, uh, point one. That would give the person a 10% raise. And then repeat till done. And then it ends. And you'll notice this time we, they, they used a, um, single pipe statement as our delimiter. So just showing you there's there's choices, right? Um, 
And then if we give raise of 0.1, it'll just bump up everybody's salaries accordingly. Okay, so that is a little bit about the cursors covered one of everything. The, especially this last example, it has one of absolutely everything in it. It's got defining the procedure with a parameter being passed in. You're declaring one, two, three variables, declaring a cursor, the, uh, declaring a handler. It's got a loop. You're opening the cursor. You're fetching the cursor. It's got an update, and it ends all of it. So this one example literally has everything you need for all the labs, pretty much. Okay. So functions. MySQL comes with a lot of predefined functions. You guys have probably played with them. Uh, concat, uh, trim, uh, min, max, you know, the, the aggregate functions. Those are built-in functions. However, we can create our own functions. And of course, by creating our own functions, we can extend the capability of the database by making it do something that maybe uh, it doesn't do by default or you need to have some special behavior. Um, the difference at this point between a store procedure and a function is the function is compiled at runtime. So every time it's called, the entire function gets compiled at that point. It's not pre-compiled. Um, functions must have a return type, and they only have a return one value. Whereas with a cursor, you have output parameters, so you can return multiple values outside of the procedure. With, um, with a function, you have multiple parameters coming in, but you have a value coming out. Um, it only supports select statements, uh, theoretically. Um, it can handle input parameters, but not output. Uh, it can't be used within a transaction. It can't call a store procedure. And in theory, of course, it's just a standard function, so it can be used in a join. And this is uh, create function with the function name. Actually, you know what? I'd rather just give you guys uh, the code example instead. OK, so we got our table as we had before with our employees, right? And our functions as follows. We define the delimiter again, just like we did before. We create a function, give it a name. All right, it's going to be called give raise. You got the old value being passed in as a double, the amount being passed in as a double. Uh, there should be actually a uh, parentheses at the end, but as you can tell, it's actually cut off because the E is not even there completely. It returns a double value. It's deterministic. Now, this is the one thing that you didn't see with a stored procedure. A function can be deterministic or not deterministic. If it's deterministic, that means that if you pass the same arguments in twice, it won't even run the function the second time. It'll return whatever value was there before. It caches the results only for a short amount of time. But let's say you had five employees and three of them are earning 30,000, two are earning 50,000 and you give everybody a 10% raise, it would calculate it for the first person, repeat the 30,000 with the calculation automatically because it hasn't changed. Then it'll do it for the 50,000 and then just reuse the pre-used value for the next one. Uh, that's what deterministic means. And then you begin, you declare the new value, set new value equal to old value times, you know, uh, the math, and then return the new value and you reset your delimiter and there's the deterministic keyword for you. Um, deterministic is used when the function will always return the same value for the same input. For example, 2 plus 2 will always be equal to 4. So if you pass in parameter 1 being 2, parameter 2 being 2, it will always return 4. There's zero chance that it'll ever be different. Non-deterministic or not deterministic is used when it's possible that the input function might return a different result. For example, you're generating a random hash to use as a salt for a password. Um, or you're using, um, or you're trying to set like some sort of uh, API key for the person. So you created a function in the database to generate an API key. And even though you'd be passing in potentially the same thing over and over and over again, the key should always be different every time it's run. Therefore, it's not deterministic. Now, this is how you use the um, the function. You can see select name, salary, give raise salary this as new value, and you would see how it's doing the, the results of the math. Then we could actually use that in the update statement. 
Um, instead of doing a select here, you go update employees, set salary equal to give raise. And magically you'll have raises. All right. So functions versus stored procedures. Functions are compiled at runtime. Stored procedures are pre-compiled, so they'll tend to run faster. Um, the functions only support select statements. Stored procedures support everything. Uh, functions can only return one value. Stored procedures cannot return a value, but it can output multiple uh, values via the parameters. Um, function only has inbound parameters. Stored procedures have both. So a function operates like a method so or a, a function in your code. So if you create a function in Python, a function in SQL behaves basically the same thing, except it's happening inside the database server. On the other hand, the service procedure is more like your Python script. If you're not writing object-oriented Python, if you're writing like old school top to bottom Python or a bash script or a, you know, insert language here script. Um, function can be used in a join clause. Store procedures can't because you call them, you don't select them. Uh, functions cannot be used with transactions inside of them, uh, but in store procedures can. So, Usually it's more desirable to use store procedures or functions because they are more flexible. They allow more operations uh, that you can do. Um, and of course they run faster. So, but if you're doing a simple task that you don't expect to do on a regular basis, the function's probably more suitable. It's just use case. You decide what's the best use for it. Now I'm gonna dive into the triggers. Uh, triggers is an interesting topic. As week 13, I'm getting the rest of the lecture material over with. So I don't know what I'm doing with you guys for the last week of class, but you know. <laughs> so triggers. Triggers are event-driven actions. So when I was going through school, this brand new, really concept-breaking language had just come out. And Almost nobody used it yet, but it became a juggernaut in business development for a long time. Can anybody in here take a guess what that language would have been? No, I'm not that old. Visual Basic, right? Visual Basic 2.0 came out as I was going through college. What Visual Basic brought to the table that no other language at that point had was called event-driven programming. So you'd design a form, and then you'd attach events to each of the things you could do on the form, like clicking on a button, double clicking on a button, uh, typing on a field, you could catch key up, key down. This is something familiar to the JavaScript crap, right? When you're learning about writing JavaScript to interact on the web page, uh, key up, uh, blur, focus, uh, val change, whatever, same idea. So that was, basic was the first language, Visual Basic was the first language that had that if you don't think about databases. Databases have events and all database servers that support triggers will support six specific moments and three events. Other database servers that are more powerful than MySQL actually support more events you can trigger off of. So, the moments is before and after, and the uh, events themselves insert, update, and delete. So we have three events times two moments gives us six points of count. We can catch events. Um, depending on the database server, a trigger may or may not be part of a transaction. MySQL does not behave right. It misbehaves. Um, and I actually have a flow chart that's going to be coming up on the screen. And if you have the slides that from the, from Brightspace, you'll probably want it because this flow chart's going to be probably too small on the screen. Um, all right. So insert, update, delete. Those are the events that drive the triggers. So as a command is executed, the query optimizer will double check to make sure that whether or not there's triggers that need to happen. So if you issue an update command, it'll look, see if there's any triggers that need to happen. And 
there is the six events is before insert, after insert, before update, after update, before delete, and after delete. So before insert means before the data has been inserted and applied to the database. After insert means it successfully wrote it to the database. Update is the same deal, right? So before the update's applied, after the update is applied, and before the delete, you know, the, before we tried to delete the data, and after delete, after the data was deleted. And if those events don't occur, the trigger won't execute because, you know, if you don't fire off an event, the trigger isn't going to happen. So if we do an up, if we only have an insert trigger defined and we issue an update, the insert trigger is not going to fire because the trigger is tied to update. Same deal with insert. Um, so there are statements that execute these events behind the scenes and they will cause the triggers uh, to run. Um, there are some interesting commands like replace and load data, which are low-level commands to, you know, load data from a file straight into a table. And replace does the same thing where you can read the data from a file and it replaces the records that match in the table. Um, those will fire the triggers. So just because you're not ex uh, explicitly firing off an insert, update, or delete, it may still fire those triggers. So, you know, just be careful. All right, so when the trigger fires off, there's going to be a chart, which is going to be right here. Like I said, it's going to be probably too small to read on the screen. All right, so when the trigger fires off, there's two data structures that may or may not get created. There's something called new and something called old. And actually, I think I have examples in the slides for this. So new contains data being pushed to the database. So if you're doing an insert and an update, it will create the new variable. So those are the new values being pushed into the database. There's one called old. So you can picture it. Um, it's almost like an object uh, in some programming languages. And so you have new, you have old, and this one will on insert, update, update, and delete. That's when these exist. And in, in here will be a complete record. So you know how when you select a, a table, select star from a table, you have every column? The new will have all the data you're pushing into the table as if it was a, a complete record. So you let's just say we have a field called name. We'd have a variable called new dot name, maybe new dot email, and old is the same thing. So old is what's there before the trigger happens. So if you're going to go update row five, what it hap what happens when the trigger triggers off, okay, when trigger fires, let's avoid saying the word trigger too many times. When the trigger fires, it'll look for the record. So we're updating number five. It'll actually take record number five, read it into memory, into an object called old. At the same time, since we're doing an update, we'll have an object called new, which has all the new values coming in. That means you can use that to compare the old values to the new values and branch your logic based on what's being passed in. So I'm going to go through the flow chart and I have an example of a trigger for you guys um, so you can see what I mean by the old and the new with a story that goes with it. So an SQL command is received. So this is pretend this is the SQL interpreter. So you've typed in a command, you've hit run. The string of the command is sent to the interpreter as a blob of text. It goes, uh, is it a manipulation command? Insert, update, or delete? Yes or no? If it's no, it executes the query, and then it ends. If it's yes, does it parse okay? Is it a valid command? As in, is, it not gonna, is there an error? If it parses bad, it raises an error, and it blows up. If it's good, it'll go 
Okay, now we're doing some sort of data manipulation, insert, update, or delete. Is there a before trigger? Yes or no? Yes, there is. It executes the trigger. Did the trigger execute correctly? Yes or no? Every time I'm going to say no from here, I know just assume we're going to the red box. Yes, it ran good. So then it'll do the, up, the insert, update, or delete. Did that command successfully end? Yes or no? If it did, it checks if there's an after trigger. If there is, it'll run it. Did it run okay? Yes, no. It outputs the results returned to the client. Those are all the steps. Now, here's where MySQL is extra. Oh, you got a question before I go? It's, the trigger is per connection for that connection. So if you've got three connections, you can run three at a time. Well, if you're lucky, your database supports proper transactions. Remember I talked about transactions last week, I think it was? A single insert statement is still treated as a single transaction. It'll be whichever one started first will lose. It's an order of operations, right? So if you fire one off and I fire it off like half a second later, it'll do your, it'll finish yours, and then it'll do mine over top of it. Okay. Yeah. But that's just, that'd be like the same as if you had a connection there and I had a connection over there and we ran them at the same time. Whichever one started first would, would win, would lose, I mean. No. No, maybe some more high-end database servers have it. Uh, MySQL absolutely does not. Okay, so here is where MySQL is extra special, right? So remember I said an insert statement is a single transaction, right? So it comes in, it's a manipulation command. There's a before trigger. It runs a before trigger. It ran okay. It executes the command. Command blows up. The before trigger still exists and it ran. Whatever it did is still valid. Okay, again, a command comes in, it makes it all the way past, it writes the data to the database correctly, sees an after trigger, it fires off the after trigger. After trigger blows up, the data is committed to the database anyways. So basically with MySQL, whatever the last thing that ran right is what is gonna be considered valid as part of that transaction. It's terrible. Unless you do a begin transaction at the beginning, and then you detect that there's an error and you do a rollback, it will commit that that thing. It's bad. Uh, so unless you use an explicit transaction, there's no way to really handle that. Every other database server, the whole thing is part of the transaction. The whole trigger is considered to be part of the transaction. So regardless of which point it fails, if it, any of it fails, the whole thing fails. So when you're working with, trans with triggers on MySQL, you just have to be aware that MySQL is really, really greedy, and it will accept anything that it likes and will continue going until it fails. And whatever it liked beforehand, that's great. That's just how it is. Okay, so some advantages of triggers. Uh, you can use them to catch errors. Um, they're actually really handy for catching weird uh, maybe, you know, have some basic rules that things aren't allowed to happen. Like, you're not allowed to delete a record if, you know, this condition happens, stuff like that. Um, you can schedule tasks. For example, a person logs in. We can use a trigger to actually add a record in the login log instead of writing special code for it. Um, one of the biggest uses for them is for auditing. A good database will audit itself. Um, remember about a month ago, I talked about, um, source Bane Oxley really quick and Enron when people were changing the books so that they looks like they were making money and they were not, 
you know, or just like Nortel for those of us from Ottawa, when Nortel was cooking, cooking the books and they owed four times as much money as they actually had. Um, so the problem is that sometimes applications can be circumvented. If the database server itself is keeping track of the changes to the records by using a, an after trigger, because we want to make sure that the data actually got written before we write in the log, right? So after trigger fires off, it takes the old data and puts it into a table with the values. Um, and you can use it for integrity checks uh, also. Um, now the issue with triggers is it increases overhead, obviously, um, because it means it's going to run code before or and or after each record's inserted. And if that's doing any kind of I.O., you're just, you know, it's scaling. Um, and of course, they're invoked from actions on the client side. So that means you may not know everything that's actually happening. Okay. So this slide applies only to MySQL because every database server has its limitations when it comes to triggers. They all have things they can and can't do. Um, Triggers cannot execute the following statements. Show, load, table, load data, backup, database, restore, flush, and return. Uh, they can't use, be used in transactions uh, that have implicit uh, commits. Um, you can do a commit and a start transaction. Theoretically, yes, I think it works now in MySQL 8. In MySQL 5.7, 5 .7, it did not. Uh, you can't lock tables, which as he was asking, you know, what happens if two of us do the same thing at the same time? At least if you're locking a table, there's a chance that the subsequent commands won't overwrite yours. Um, and you can't call store procedures or functions. And I'm going to put a slight item here in an in-between. Uh, good database servers actually have triggers for select statements. Uh, for example, Postgres has a special uh, kind of trigger. It's a create a trigger and it's on the select statement, but it returns, it's called instead of. What you can do is it, you can run a create a trigger that you go select star from customers and it'll detect you're selecting from customers. And then instead of executing that select statement, it'll actually do an instead of, and it'll actually, you can actually write a trigger that selects data from a different table. So let's say you have a really old legacy system that has one table structure. You could do an instead of trigger to go grab the data from a different table, which is really cool. Because uh, you can basically, as far as the application is concerned, nothing has changed. But you might be working with a whole new data structure. Um, all right. So the syntax as follows. Create trigger with a name. You give it the time and the event on table for each row. And I'm going to explain that one in a moment. Um, then you have the trigger actions. And the trigger time is before or after. The event is insert, update, or delete. Um, the Trigger is, the trigger name is usually unique for the table, but as a rule of thumb, you want to make your trigger names unique throughout the entire database, because if you're trying to track down which trigger is misbehaving and you've got five of them with the same name, it gets a little challenging to find where the bug is. So as a rule of thumb, try to make your trigger names all unique. All right. So. Here's an example of a trigger and setter delimiter. Like as I said before, with the store procedure and the function, same deal. And it's create trigger. And I'm going to, this one's called product serial number log. After update on a table called products for each row. And actually I didn't explain for each row. So when you create a trigger, you have the option for it to be a per row trigger or a global trigger. So let's just say your update statement affects multiple rows. If you use for each row, let's say it update, you're updating five rows, it'll fire the trigger off five times. If you don't include for each row, it'll fire off the trigger once when all five commands are done, like five updates are done. So it changes when it behaves. Um, I rarely have ever seen a need for something that is not for each row. And then you have your begin and your end as always. And here's some handy little code. If old serial number is not equal to new serial number, then it's updating, inserting into a log. Then it does the end if, trigger ends. There's a story behind this trigger. Uh, 
I'm the one that provided it for this course years ago. Um, it's been rewritten, so it's not quite identical to what I use at work, uh, for obviously for IP reasons. Um, years and years and years ago, when we had an online registration system that was not particularly secure, let's let's go with that. It was written before you know best practices were a thing. It was a project written for a single customer. And then the OEM manager managed to sell that concept to half a dozen other customers. So we certainly had a bunch of people hitting this page. And one day, and I was actually working somewhere else for a while. I took a little um, sabbatical from my day job to go work somewhere else. I get a phone call, a panicked phone call on my cell. Hey, Dan, um, can you talk to your boss? We want to hire you for like two days. And I go, okay, because I work for a contracting company. So I go, I'm on my phone, right? And I go to work over my boss's office. I go, uh, Craig, you got a minute? He goes, yeah. I hand him my phone. And then I hear him go, yeah, yeah. He goes, it's so much an hour, blah, 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 blah. Then he hands me back the phone. And Craig just says, just go help them. They're desperate. What had happened is we had a um, person of uh, ill intent, let's say. I had very much more colorful words to describe this person. Um, was written Had written a script that was hitting our registration system, randomly feeding values. And he'd gotten to the point where he'd started hitting values that worked with our internal database. And he was changing serial numbers on people's products. And of course, we're trying to figure out how this guy is doing it. So the function, I ended up creating a, well, we knew at first what he was doing. So, you know, we tightened up the code. After two, three days, he suddenly managed to get back in after three days. Like this was like game of cat and mouse going on and on and on. So our system is Postgres. And one of the cool features of Postgres is in the middle of a trigger, you can ask the interpreter, what was the command that fired this off? So in the log, I was actually including the actual update, insert, or delete command. So every single time a serial number was changed, I was logging the actual command that fired it off. So then I could go look at that command and do the good old uh, grep on the whole file system to see which chunk of PHP this command was coming from. Found it, tightened that down. Uh, this game lasted two years. Um, what he was doing, because the way your system used to work is you'd put in your information, including your uh, serial number. We had something called dongles, physical locks, and serial numbers are generated to that. And it was generating an encrypted license file. So what he was doing is it was feeding known values into the system to get license files back out. Because how do you how you decrypt things? You feed known values into the encryption algorithm because if certain things are always the same, you know that's probably where that value is, and you can start decrypting. Uh, so if anybody in here is ever interested in doing crypto work, you know, it's interesting math. So what he didn't know is we were actually putting in a random seed at the top of the file. So no matter if you did the same thing three times, it'd be a different file every time. But, you know, he didn't know that. Um, so we played cat and mouse. So I wrote a trigger like this in our database. It's still there to this day. Um, our serial number log table is insanely large. Uh, last time I checked, it's at like 4 million rows. It's going back 12 years. So one of the cool parts of this is we now had an undo function because now we could identify records that were changed with the old serial numbers. So we had, we'd store the old serial number, the new serial number, when it happened, and the command that fired it off. So we could, we could tell. We couldn't tell which PHP script fired it off, but we could tell what command it was. And based on how the command was written, because it actually kept this, the um, case. So, you know, if the update was written uppercase versus lowercase, you know, I could search for that pattern in our files and find the files are, that were triggering this off. So, yeah, the game, the game lasted for a while. We ended up banning the Netherlands for almost a year. Uh, because this guy was coming out of uh, the Netherlands, because the Netherlands has a law that allows for private proxies regardless of where you are in the world. So you can just use the private proxy to hide who you are. That was before Tor. So those of us that know how to use Tor, um, that was before Tor. So he was coming through a private proxy. He was always exiting out of Amsterdam. We knew where he was coming from. Problem is that he was coming through a private proxy for, for the Netherlands' largest ISP. So by the time we banned that entire ISP, we banned like 80% of the Netherlands. 
<laughs> yeah, until we figured out how to resolve this. And it was years, years and years and years. And then once in a while, you know, I'd look at my logs and there he is again, hitting the server. He's not getting anywhere anymore because we tightened it down, but tightened it. Ah, oh, no, that's whatever. It's not even worth the effort trying to hunt him down. He never got a functional license file. It was just damaging our database, so we stopped it from being able to damage the database. And we put in some fail to ban rules. Somebody tries this five times in, you know, 10 seconds, they get banned for temporary. And then, you know, an hour later, they get unbanned. We just slowed him down until it wasn't worth his time anymore. Um, okay, so one other thing that we can do with a trigger, and this one's a before delete trigger. Um, so create trigger, and we gave it a name before delete on products log. So for example, you know, we have a products log table in this, and we don't want to allow anybody to ever delete the data in that table. And it's, you know, challenging to set all the permissions properly, especially when it's a web app. So it's create trigger before delete on this for each row begin. This right here is how you raise an error. So, you know, in, uh, I don't know how you do it in Python, but in PHP, it's uh, raise exception. Um, you can basically cause an error, a 400 or 500 error, your choice, right? And this here, we return a 45,000 error message and we set the text. So if we tried to delete the data from there, it would actually fail and blow up right away and tell you, no, you're not allowed to delete the data, which is kind of cool. So you can put in protection for your tables by having a before delete trigger. You can also have a before update trigger so that you can't even update the data. Just insert. Okay, so that was the trigger. Yes, there was a lot of information today. Um, so next week is going to be the review. And by then I will have the exam figured out. So I'll be able to tell you guys exactly what you need to study. Um, I'll also do a few demos of the functions and whatnot so that you guys can actually see it happening. Um, cause I know today was a lot of information that went in, even though it was just an hour and everybody's brains are probably melted right now. Even if I started doing demos, I wouldn't even go in. So, um, yeah, so the thing is, is that most of this, the hardest part is just wrapping your brain around the syntax, the strange syntax of how you declare it. But the inside is just like any other program you've written. You've got your for loops, you've got your if statements. It's just the syntax doesn't look like Pythons or like PHPs or like JavaScripts. It actually looks like basic. Like it's very, um, Like this is how you'd, that this line right here is how you'd literally write that in basic way back in the day. So if ever you've played with basic, this will feel familiar. If you've never worked with basic, this will not feel familiar. <laughs> um, yeah. So outside of that, um, you guys have got, so like I've recommended is when you try to do the last the last two labs, I usually recommend you try to do them all in one go. That way, once you, because you'll find some error, you'll hit some mistakes or hit some errors and you'll be working with teammates or whatever, right? Which is cool. And you're getting stuck. And then suddenly you realize what the problem is. Then you finish that work and then you put it away. The next week you start again and then you're not gonna remember what it was that you had the problem with. Both these labs are not very big. So in theory, once you've got the first one figured out, the second one's going to be pretty much there also. So don't, uh, don't over, uh, it's the same thing as when you're learning to write bash script files. That bash is terrible. Um, it's like the worst language on earth. Um, so this isn't too bad, but it, it is what it is. Okay, anybody have any questions for me before I hit the stop record? All right.